thank you so much. I'm so excited to have the two of you with us. I think especially if this is a solutions conference, I think the two of you represent some of the real on the ground solutions um, that we're seeing in California, Vermont, and the rest of the country. Um, you know, in, in 2016, renewables represented half of all new generation capacity in the US, but we are still dealing, as we've heard yesterday and earlier this morning, with a power grid that is reliant on, on aging infrastructure. Susan, let, let's start with your experience. How do we transition the grid? How do we make the US power grid largely renewable and do it quickly? I think the answer is fairly straightforward. Follow the customer. The customers will lead this revolution on the grid. Um, you've got customers that are already incorporating s solar, storage, uh, on-site generation and micro turbines and, and biogas digesters. I mean, all the technologies that allow them to control their fate and, uh, and generate uh, clean, reliable resources are being deployed. Um, the, and the entire infrastructure of the grid was designed to serve those customers. And so the, the changes really have to occur in the relationship between the utilities and the customers they're serving. And I, I think the fastest way to, to, uh, to deploy and to clean the grid is to follow the customer. And this is something that we were talking a lot about backstage. And, and Mary, you and I talked last week, and, uh, and you described the, the grid as, as patriarchal. Um, <laughs> And, uh, which I think is a good conversation I to have on an all woman it, panel. As many other things as that, so, yeah. But I, I, yeah, I, what that I means totally agree also with Susan's perspective. Um, you know, what we really see our role being is accelerating what we view as a consumer-led revolution uh, mm. to a different energy system. And our whole vision and our whole work is around how can we transform from this patriarchal, uh, completely uneconomic, inefficient, uh, you know, centuries old system. Break that uh, down for us, though. To, what does that mean? To a, to a community home and business based energy del delivery system. Right. So, breaking it down, I mean, simply put, as many people here probably in, in the audience realize, the grid was again designed, you know, our company was formed in 1893. Okay, <laughs> Green Mountain Power in Vermont, and it was designed a very long time ago. It was a very, uh, you know, uh, patriarchal approach, which is, you know, stay where you are, we'll deliver it to you on our terms, our way, through a very, very big bulk kind of delivery system that is, uh, you know, fine. I mean, the thing that first struck me coming to the industry from largely a financial background was how economically inefficient it is. You know, on a good day, the bulk system is about 40 to 42 percent economically efficient. Wow. So uh, just from that basis alone, when you layer in then climate and you layer in resilience and you layer in uh, technologies and advancements, you know, we really see again in our customer obsessed approach that our role is to turn the energy system inside out and to change uh, the entire way we think about delivery. And you've, you've described Green Mountain Power and, and your, as, as an unutility uh, yeah. and yourself as a, as a unutility. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that how, we, how we see ourselves now is as an energy transformation company yeah. that is uh, focused on, on delivering individualized energy solutions to the communities, homes, and businesses that we serve. And that's, that's how we think of ourselves as an energy transformation company. Um, you know, we started talking about ourselves being the unutility many years ago because our whole goal, we were talking, Susan and I, backstage about culture change and our whole our whole work started with cultural transformation, which we really believed we could only get to be the customer obsessed, loving organization that we wanted to be if we dramatically shifted the entire culture of the organization. So we started talking about we need to become the unutility. We need to be fast, fun, and effective. We need to have you feel like you love your interaction with us, right? So not that's <laughs> no your utility. We talk about love a lot. We're not afraid to talk about love. Love and we're not afraid to talk about being uh, fun, uh, but we also really want to be fast and effective. This, this is really the heart of what is happening in terms of the, the way the grid is changing. Yeah. I mean, the whole physical infrastructure of the grid was designed around the concept that you cannot store 
electricity. And so it's designed to be produced up here. We forecast and guess what the end use is going to be, and then we, we, we serve those customers. Customers are now enabled to self-serve. They're able to serve themselves, and they're able to control their consumption. That puts them in the driver's seat in terms of what is how you balance supply and demand. So what, what Green Mountain Power is doing that is just so am amazing, in, in my view, is fully embracing the role of the end use customer in balancing supply and demand. They have market power here. Utilities are in a, in a price war with their own consumers. And so by embracing that and actually enabling that and providing energy solutions and energy management, not just trying to just sell them electricity, that is what is revolutionizing the grid. And then explain to us what hybrid electric buildings are. Um, how, does, how does this work? What are you doing? Our concept is, is simple, that the, the building itself as a consumer of, of electricity is, uh, has a lot of market power. And so by harnessing the load, every kilowatt hour being consumed can be controlled, managed, repurposed, and utilized for some grid service or some customer service, whether it's backup generation for data systems or you know, critical fire life safety, uh, also providing flexible capacity and reserve capacity. I mean, you can actually, if you, if you harness the building to be able to switch fuels to battery instantaneously, you can actually make the entire building part of the grid infrastructure. And so a hydroelectric building harnesses the load with batteries as, as much as half the building. In some cases, more than half the building load can be switched to, to the battery fuel source instantaneously. And we aggregate those in fleets to, in order to provide utility scale grid services. You know, so 10, 15 years ago, this was sort of a, 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 a realm of visions and, and dreams. What, outside of, of changing the culture, what are some of the biggest technical challenges that you face right now? Um, I mean, let's first, I, first Susan and then Mary. There's a lot of them. <laughs> uh, it, it's, I think the single, if I had to try and boil it down into something simple, which there's nothing simple about, about this, is that a battery, everyone looks at storage, re regulators, industry folks, utilities, probably everyone in this room talks about storage as if the batteries matter. Nobody wants batteries. They want energy savings. They want control. They want clean. They want the, they want the products that an ener that a battery can provide. All the rules from the util the regulatory side to the wholesale market rules to the way the utility treats it, they treat batteries differently. It's a Rorschach test, hmm. right? And so the interconnection. When you're interconnecting a battery. It's a generating resource. That's one set of interconnection rules. If it's used for demand response, that's a demand response product. Entirely different set of interconnection rules. And the difference matters because it matters what I can, what I can do with that battery and what value I can create from it. And so aligning the rules as to what energy product you're producing from the battery is the single greatest technical challenge we face. And when it comes to grid reliability and, and serving the customer? Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I love hearing that perspective, Susan, and, and maybe some of it is, uh, you know, as we know, all the states are very different in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, we have some regional rules, but we also have, uh, you know, really energy policies and approaches driven by the states. And I, I do feel really lucky to operate in Vermont, where I think we really have had a lot of innovative thinking at the legislative level, the regulatory level, the political level around how we can make this transformation. So I actually, you know, I feel like the technology's there. Um, what we really need to do, again, is accelerate this consumer-led revolution to a different delivery system. You know, we, we, we don't and sit around and, want, and talk about like big roadblocks to how to get there. We talk about how do we, again, accelerate awareness of the options, about the choices, about the ability to really move to this community home uh, and business-based energy delivery system. And so it really is truly about how do we turn it completely inside out. So again, instead of this bulk delivery where the, the, these storage devices and solar panels are like ornaments on the Christmas tree, right. right? How do we make the tree 
the, the, this, this community-based energy system and have the bulk system really become more of the backup delivery system. It will be a much more resilient, uh, uh, you know, from a climate perspective, cost-effective way to operate the grid. So we, companies like Susan's are very, very important to this because the huge piece is going to be the piece around how do we leverage these assets so that we optimize this bulk system that we're stuck with really, right? We're stuck with it for decades to come. So we have to figure out a way to make it work as economically as we can as we lead this transformation. So having those software platforms and those abilities to integrate those resources is, is key, but they also are here and we're using them. Let me, let me turn back for a few minutes. You, you mentioned climate change and I wanna discuss um, the grid's vulnerability to climate change. What, what are we seeing now that we weren't seeing even 10, 15 years ago? I mean, obviously we saw the, the tremendous devastation that, um, that the hurricanes did to Puerto Rico uh, in terms of the grid, but even in Vermont, um, you know, there were, we've talked about the storms that yep. hit earlier this year. Um, is the grid ready for climate change? Oh. Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> no. And actually, I mean, one of the things I and so many others I know uh, desperately tried to insert ourselves in after the devastation in Puerto Rico is like it's the definition of insanity to do the same thing over and over and expect different results. And so we're insanely pursuing rebuilding the bulk system as it was before uh, Mother Nature rolled in. Um, and Mother Nature is in charge. And, you know, it has been devastating. You know, that is, again, a huge example. So if, and, and we have tried to be in a, a supporting cast role with other leaders uh, who are stepping in to provide uh, solutions, like in Puerto Rico, where we have the opportunity to rebuild that in a completely different model uh, that would be way more resilient to uh, climatic events. And so, you know, for me in Vermont, that was a big part of what informed our strategy. When I interviewed at the company many, many years ago, it was right after a huge ice storm. And I'll never forget being told in the interview, like, uh -huh, good for you, because we just had this like once in 200 year event. So like in your career here, you won't have to deal with that. <laughs> and literally it has been, I have had like so many once in 100 year events, once in 200 year events, you know, literally. And it, it, I'll never forget once being out in the field, because that's always where I am when we have events with customers in communities, with folks working on, on, the, on the job. And you know, I went to this site and saw a bunch of the guys, it's guys, working on this system, and it literally was a line that we had just invested a good amount of money with storm hardening, vegetation management, all the things that you know you have to do, right? And, it, and, I, and I just looked at it and I thought, it's twigs and twine. When Mother Nature rolls in, this system, no matter how hard, you know, hardened we make it, this bulk system becomes twigs and twine. I've seen Hydro-Quebec's transmission system much like we saw with Puerto Rico, flattened by ice. So yeah. solution? Yeah. Well, I mean, and uh, Southern California, I think, is also is, is ground zero in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Uh, in part because by by taking our nuclear facility offline, it created this capacity uh, um, problem in in the LA basin. And we have all these renewables we brought online. We have a 44 percent reserve margin with all the renewables we brought online in the desert. But trying to get that power to where it's being consumed in the LA basin is over the old trans transmission infrastructure distribution. All it takes is one uh, one fire, um, and you can cut off an entire region for days, weeks, right? I mean, so it's the the way we're, and I think Southern California Edison is leading in in our state uh, on the West Coast with they recognized that they could not replace that nuclear plant with traditional resources. And so they're on the leading edge of uh, providing these distributed, enabling customers to use distributed resources to help balance the grid. And so it, we're, it's a, but it's a very, uh, it's a very forward leaning utility that does it a new way, mm -hmm. you know, and. But, but explain that. So, so the, it, Southern California Edison is trying to get more energy to the Los Angeles Basin, the grid is, uh, you know, threatened by any 
storm that, you know, or wildfire that, that hits it, how, wh what is the protection for, um, you know, for millions of, of customers? They're, they've, they're putting in hundreds of megawatts of energy storage and providing customers with the ability to pair energy storage with solar so that they can not only uh, dampen the effects of intermittency with renewables at the, at the substation level, but they can also rely on consumers to curb their own peak demand when there's cloud cover. Right. Or when, I mean, major cloud cover comes across in California, we could lose 800 megawatts off the grid. Huh. You know, try balancing that without <laughs> having peaker plants on, on you know, standby. And so they're, they're leaning in by harnessing, allowing the customer to harness their own load, but they've truly invested in hardening the, 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 uh, the grid at the consumer level up uh, with energy storage. But I think that does speak to one of the conundrums facing us. I mean, one of the challenges is that, you know, from a climate perspective, we need to lean in, I believe, hard to having a lot you know, moving much more quickly to renewables, but at the same time where we're doubling down on massive utility scale renewable projects that rely on this paternalistic grandma's electric system to deliver it. Um, you know, while at the same time there's this consumer led revolution going on, you know, I, I do wonder a lot <laughs> about should we start to put more weight on the scale towards accelerating the distributed solutions uh, when you think of, uh, you know, where should capital be moving and where would it serve society from the best perspective long term? It, it does, I think it does raise an interesting question about uh, how I'll we I'll take how you one step accelerate. further and say it is critical that we actually put more emphasis on this and there has to be a, a, a political and regulatory hand put on the scale because the utilities are doing what they're told. I was a regulator when we approved most of the contracts that are, all the big renewable contracts that are coming online, you know, uh, creating what's known as the belly of the duck, mm -hmm. right? They were, they were the contracts we put online and, and told the utilities to buy. I was in the governor's office when we, when we signed the legislation on the, the, the great, the RPS goals and, and the, the climate change goals. And so we've created this, this, this massive uh, deployment of renewables, which is now, we're very proud of because it's, it's powering in some days more more than 50 to 60 percent of our grid is running on, on renewables. Now, and now we have to put the emphasis on the infrastructure, and the infrastructure uh, upgrade has to be led at the consumer level. And that's the difference. That, and the, the, the political leadership has to come from the regulatory side and the legislative side in order to be able to put that hand on the grid for distribution. So but to you... really innovate fast enough, we've also got to move from, that's also I think part of our paternalistic challenge problem, which is it's the assumption that the utilities need to be told what to do. You know, where in reality, really? most of what we've accomplished is because we have been extremely rebellious to <laughs> Green Mountain Power, and we have been obsessed with the customer, and we thank goodness have had a structure around us that had enough transparency and daylight of what we were doing to then also trust us to innovate on behalf of the customers. So that's, that that's is also a big part of the dysfunction true. we have. So they were like this backstage too. So they barely <laughs> need me. They've got a million ideas back and forth between one another. But let, let me just ask, when it comes to policy and policymakers and what, what the industry needs, what do you need from Washington? Because right now, um, you know, we've heard Energy Secretary Rick Perry tout the importance of energy storage, yet the Energy Department's budget uh, slashes funding for the for Electricity Reliability Office. Um, the Senate has restored some of that money, but what, you know, do, is this something that the market can take care of, or do you need both money and policy direction from, from Washington? I mean, look, if I could wave a magic wand, we would have a lot more going towards, you know, again, accelerating, I think, the technological advances of these distributed technologies that could change the world. Um, that said, at this point, what I really hope for the most is, you know, our focus is move as fast as we can and transform the relationship and the system as fast as we can, um, despite everything else swirling around us, you know? And so I think that, you know, one of the things I've been heartened by, and maybe I'm, I am a naturally 
born optimist, so I will confess that. But one of the things I'm heartened by is that I am seeing a lot of organizations uh, like Green Mountain Power, I would say, lean in even harder. Uh, in, in sort of reaction to what is going on around us. And so my hope is like at this point, like just stay out of the freaking way and let us continue to innovate and move forward as fast as we possibly can at each of our respective local levels. Okay, so one response to Washington is stay out of the way. I, I would say that the, the technology is, is, is happening and, and, and flourishing. It doesn't need the government. It needs the government to get out of the way. But they, um, it, the private investment follows the, uh, the tax incentives. And so the uh, I mean, battery, it's energy storage is the critical technology of any flavor. Any flavor energy storage is required to harden the infrastructure at the distribution level and the consumer level. The, um, uh, the, uh, the investment tax credit is, was the single most powerful tool for deploying solar, distributed solar in the nation. And it's the reason that we have so much being deployed today. Having uh, allowing both you know property taxes and tax credits for the uh, for storage technologies would open the floodgates in terms of private sector investment, including and that and I, I include utility investment in the private sector investment in that as well as customers investing in it. I, I'm going to close the loop on this conversation, but we have an incredibly dynamic audience. I want you to start thinking of questions. I'll turn to you in just a, in just a moment. Um, but just to to follow up on that, Susan. So if if um, if there is indeed a severe cut in funding for um, for the Office of Grid Reliability, for things like mission innovation, which under uh, former President Obama would have doubled R&D for clean energy technologies and private industry would have kicked in uh, some unyet disclosed amount of money, that's, you know, that's something that was eliminated. How does that trickle down, how is, how is that felt in, in your industries? Um, and what does, that, what does that mean for you? I'm gonna sound slightly heretical here, but it, it really doesn't. I, I mean, mm. it, there are some technologies that come out of you know, government research. I mean, yeah. The internet you know, technically came out of uh, you know, government research. And, but where we're at in terms of the state of technology today, um, you don't need gov the government to, to, to actually foster that. There's so much innovation going on. There's so much intelligence and there's so much money being put into these innovative technologies that I don't, I don't think it actually has an impact. That's pretty exciting. Yeah, I think it is. Let's turn to the audience. We have uh, roving microphones. I see a question in the second row on the end here towards me. Um, the And if you could state your name and ask questions as questions, that would help us with time. Thank you. Holden Meyer, Union of Concerned Scientists. Thanks for this. I want to talk about something Governor Brown talked about yesterday, which is electrifying the transportation sector mm -hmm. and sort of the electric vehicle revolution. What is, implication does that have for the grid? Can EVs be a resource tapped in for the grid? Uh, are they a challenge to the grid if you add that much new? Uh, demand on the system. How are you dealing with that in, in Vermont and the Northeast? Yeah, great, great question. Um, and one of the things I love about operating in this space right now is none of us really know, <laughs> right? You know, so, um, I, you know, we're in that space. We actually have a whole EV charger program. We have, as part of our energy transformation suite, we offer the opportunity for customers to go completely off grid and we provide energies as an energy service. So we're in that space. Uh, what I would tell you is nothing we're seeing suggests to us at all that the future looks like growth uh, growing over the traditional delivery system. So what we see is even as there are these advancements, we are facing a future where there is a steady decline in the use of the bulk delivery paternalistic model of you stay put and I deliver to you when you need it, right? So as part of this whole interactive relationship, we see that as being really important. We see that as huge from a carbon perspective and some of the carbon reductions we've been able to achieve in Vermont. Um, but we don't see it growing load on the grid. 
uh, and we see it as really a transformative. What the data would show to you is customers who tend to go towards that technology, tend to go towards storage technologies, tend to go towards solar technologies, tend to go towards more locally based energy technologies. So we believe it's all part of that acceleration to a distributed environment. And I would add to that the, um, it's both a challenge and an opportunity built in. It's two sides of one coin. Um, you know, the, the, whole, the whole game in the new distribution grid, the new grid, is going to be being able to control your demand. If you cannot control your demand, then, the, then everybody has to plan for what your peak might be. So when you're installing energy, we've actually analyzed a number of, we do, we're, we're in the CNI space primarily, and we have, we, we've analyzed what happens when you install uh, light duty vehicle infrastructure for a fleet, right? And like a, you know, a DHL type or a FedEx type fleet. They have schedules where they come in and they charge their, their, their vehicles. If you're not planning for how you're going to manage that load on your grid, you, you're, you could be looking at a 6x jump in your peak load at periods during the day like that look like this, right? Catastrophic in terms of, of cost to that, to that end use customer if it's plug load. If that system is designed to be able to harness its own, uh, its own peak demand so that you can buffer it with some stationary storage, you've not only solved the problem on the grid so they don't have to plan for if your peak is gonna be up here three times a day, but you've also reduced your cost by about 75%. So designing the solution with the grid in mind is the key to integrating it. I was hoping we'd be able to get a couple questions in, but if there's one question to get before we wrap up, that is a great one. Um, I believe that we need to wrap up. Unfortunately, we could talk to you guys all day. Thank you so much for, for being here today, yeah. and thank you very much for, for your attention.